In the last few weeks, I've had the opportunity to teach the Book of Romans to two distinct groups of people, each for a week at a time. I cover a lot of doctrines in that kind of study in a week's time, everything from the Word of God to the doctrine of the Trinity, from election to glorification. And yet, in each case, the point that the people kept coming back to in the question and answer periods was the matter of the human will and whether the will is free of itself to respond to the preaching of the gospel or whether it is in such bondage to sin that it is unable to respond unless God, first of all, does a work of regeneration in the human heart. That's an important question, of course. I had been teaching on the basis of Romans 1 that left to himself, man always runs from God. But if that's true, how is it that the gospel can be preached to a fallen sinner in any meaningful way? The Bible does say that we are dead in trespasses and sins, but does that mean that we are utterly and totally dead so far as any ability to respond to God is concerned, or is it merely using that phrase in somewhat poetical language? Can we respond? If we are able to respond, then what did Jesus mean when he said in John 6, 45 and 65, no one can come to me unless the Father who has sent me draws him, or no one can come to me unless the Father enables him. But if, on the other hand, we are not able to come to God in and of ourselves, then what is the meaning of those many free offers of the gospel that we find scattered throughout Scripture? Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. These questions are forced upon us by the verse to which we have come in our study of Romans 3, Romans 3.11. For here Paul has been talking in a summary way of the nature and extent of human sin. He's already shown in conclusive language that all are unrighteous so far as the righteousness of God is concerned. Verse 10 says, there is no one righteous, not even one. But then having said that, he immediately goes on to say, there is no one who understands, and moreover, there is no one who seeks God. Now this matter of the bondage of the will, or our inability to seek out God, is, as we might suspect, something that was uh, discussed again and again in church history. Anything as important as this must have been discussed in church history, and of course that's true. And this means that it is most helpful in trying to understand what's involved to look at the way those debates unfolded. They took place at different points, but the first significant debate on this matter of the freedom or bondage of the will was between Pelagius and the early church father, St. Augustine. Now, Pelagius, at the beginning at least, didn't mean to deny the universality of sin. He was quite willing to admit that all are sinners. After all, the Bible does say all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But what troubled Pelagius was the matter of responsibility. He didn't see how it was possible to say that a man or a woman is responsible for doing something if it is not possible for the man or woman to do that particular thing. If I ought to do something, well, then I must be able to do it, was Pelagius' argument. And so he began to talk about sin as something that was not at all inevitable for men and women, even in their fallen state, and of the will as being essentially neutral. Whenever a choice 
comes before us, a choice between good and evil, at any period, uh, man or woman has the option in and of himself or herself, either of going in God's way and doing the good or going in the devil's way and doing what is evil. Now, at the beginning, Augustine thought much the way Pelagius did, that is, in his early days. But when he became a Christian, and as he began to study the Bible and study it thoroughly, he came to see that Pelagius' view didn't do justice to the Bible's teaching on two things. First of all, the nature and the scope of sin, and secondly, the necessity of grace. Pelagius failed to see, as uh, Augustine came to see and wrote, that sin in the biblical perspective is much more than individual and isolated acts of wrong. It is true that individually and in isolated ways we do wrong. But the reason we do wrong, the Bible teaches, is because we're sinners. The Bible uh, speaks of what we might call a hereditary connection between the individuals of the race. Adam sinned, and so we sin. We are sinners because of Adam's sin, and because we are sinners, we transgress the law of God as well. Moreover, sin is a pervasive thing. It's not something that just affects our intellect or our spiritual understanding or our wills or any other isolated part of our psychological or spiritual makeup. Sin is something that affects us throughout, radically, from top to bottom. Nothing we do, nothing we think, nothing we can choose is unaffected by sin's presence. So if we are sinners throughout, as the Bible teaches we are, then it is quite obvious that even in the matter of the will, we're unable to choose God because being sinners, we naturally reject God and run from him. Moreover, Augustine saw that the view known as Pelagianism didn't do justice to the grace of God because, as I indicated a moment ago, if uh, even in the small matter of the will, what ultimately determines whether I or you are going to be in heaven or whether we are not going to be in heaven, uh, if what ultimately determines that is our will, our ability to choose or reject God, then it's not entirely of grace that you and I are saved. Oh, it might be 80% of grace, might be 99 and 44, 100th percent of grace, but in the final analysis, the little thing that makes a difference is our will, and that is not something that is given to us by God, according to this view, but something that we possess in and of ourselves. Augustine well understood that if Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 means anything, when it says, by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves, even that is the gift of God, not of works, as any man should boast, then we must not say that in the final analysis we are saved by our choices. That diminishes the glory of God and takes what rightly belongs to God and applies it to fallen and sinful men and women. Well, in his day, Augustine carried the day, and the church agreed with him. The church of the Middle Ages endorsed the view of Augustine and did so rightly because it was biblical. And yet, because the tendency of human nature is always to exalt man and diminish God, the church gradually drifted back in the direction of Pelagianism during the latter Middle Ages. Now, at the time of the Reformation, the same debate erupted once again. It erupted in two forms. First, between Erasmus, the Dutch humanist, and Martin Luther, and then secondly, between Jacob Arminius of Holland and the followers of John Calvin. Of these debates, the more interesting one, uh, at least the one that is easy to grasp in terms of distinct personalities, is that between Erasmus and Martin Luther. Erasmus was, at the beginning, quite a friend of the Reformation. Because he was an intelligent man, an upright man. And he saw, as all wise people did in those days, that the church very much needed to be reformed. So he spoke well of Luther. The difficulty was that Erasmus didn't have Martin Luther's spiritual undergirdings. He was essentially just an enlightened humanist. So the time came as Luther gained prominence and the reforms of the Reformation began to be more extensive in the church. 
that those who were against the Reformation prevailed upon Erasmus to write some